Okay. You remember from last week that we started playing within the models that are the most important models in this course. First, we played the Kono game and play over capacity. And we discussed the first mover advantage concerning merging and totally whether f the Stackelberg game when the first mover advantage was a good strategy or not. And we went through the uh, Biotormanner where they instead of playing over prices, playing over capacity, as in the Kono game, they play over prices. And the difference in real world is that the Kono game is always a game where there is no such thing as access capacity. The Kono game is a game where they play over capacity and price with exact Nash equilibrium in both the capacity game and the price game. While when you play the battle game, you play over prices and you always have excess capacity. And if the players have a capacity that is high enough to capture the whole market, and if it is a homogeneous product, they will underbid each other all the way down to price equal to marginal cost. And if they just to some extent have excess capacity, but none of the players have enough capacity to capture the entire market, the Nash equilibrium will be somewhat different. We come back to that model later on. Today, we have a whole chapter, chapter nine, that is all about the famous prisoner's dilemma game. I introduced to you last time the prisoner's dilemma game, and it is really a dilemma why the players don't succeed to reach the collusion solution. And this chapter is all about how can they change the rules of the game to move towards collusion instead of ending up in prisoner's dilemma. So this is all about strategy. And it's strategy when you have identified that you are playing the prisoner's dilemma. And why come it wasn't that easy? The first and most important reason was that it is illegal to contract <coughs> price collusion. <coughs> they are not allowed <coughs> to come up with a contract where they sign a contract agreeing on, on the price. So open collusion is not allowed. 
because the contract is illegal and you will get directly into jail and the antitrust law is a very very strict one and people responsible for signing when we taken directly and be accused and be put into jail if they can prove that you signed a contract. But is there any possibility out there that the players in a way can signal to each other? Say if they have reached the collusion solution. And one of them is very tempted to cheat. Instead of playing high price, one of them wants very much to underbid, play low price, and capture a much higher market share. The first of all, to be able to play by signaling, it's very, very important that it's easy to identify that one is cheating. So the first assumption for any single game to go on is that the game is very simple to identify cheaters. Second, once you have identified that one of the players are cheating, you must in one way or another be able to punish him. To punish him or her with some kind of punishment that is hard enough to make it work to keep the player from cheating. We had the example with the prisoners that if you knew that if you cheat you will be killed immediately when you leave the prison. If you know that you will be killed you don't cheat. Why not? Because it's easy to see that you have cheated and that is seen when you leave the prison and when the punishment is you will be killed you never cheat. But what is enough as some kind of punishment to keep the collusion going. And this is what this chapter is all about. How can we change the rules of the game and what are the important strategic elements to change so far that you end up in the preferred alternative. Not preferred for the consumers, but for the producers. Because for the consumers, it's always good that the prices are low. So let's start playing. Next one. And this was our simple case. And here are the figures. They can collude, collude, and achieve 100 profit each. Or they can defect, defect, or cheat. 
and end up in 8080. And once you are in the cell 100, 100, it's so tempting for Westinghouse and General Action, General Electric, to defect because the profit will go from 100 to 120. So they have incentives to defect, put the prices down. Why come they don't do it? Let's now change the rules of the game and say that these players play over and over and over and over again. And let's imagine that they have an horizon, horizon that they play 200 times. And this game, if they collude, they will have 100 each when they collude. And if they play 200 times, they can, by colluding, achieve 20,000. By colluding. How can I, by playing over and over and over again, end up in a position to capture 220,000 instead of 16,000. Because if both defect, they will end up in 16,000. And that's a big difference. Can they, by playing over and over again, in the tournament, end up in capturing 20,000. Let's now look at what we call a strategy, tit for tat. And what's meant with tit for tat? Tit for tat is meant that you always, when you play tit for tat, you play collude. But when you have played, you observe the outcome. And if you see that your rival has detected, you immediately punish him by detecting. You play tit for tat. And if he moves back to colluding, you observe that, and since you play tit for tat, you immediately change into colluding. So if you choose a tit for tat strategy, you end up by first colluding, because you want to collude, and if your rival plays detect, you play detect in the second round, what will your rival do then? Play collude. And then the rest of the game will be colluding. So you can easily see that if you play over and over and over again, an easy way out of it is just to choose tit for tat. 
I'm not playing tit for that. <coughs> That's not very aggressive. If he will do what you want him to do, you act just like he did. And if he does not play the way you want him to play, you just respond playing just the same game. So it's a kind of, it's a nice guy. And I've played it for that. And since I do that, I have both of us to end up colluding. Because <coughs> I can easily detect who has cheated and I can easily punish him in one round and that has its price. But since you return back in the next round, the price is low. So tit for touch strategy is safe. So if you know when you work in the ferry sector that you want the high price on all the sealed bid that you will deliver in a competitive tendering game, and if you know that you're going to meet each other over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, you can just start playing tit for tat. If one of the player was very aggressive in one round, you will be very aggressive in the next. If, if your rival will abide in the next round, you will too. And then you can go on playing high part. Just by accepting that tit for tat is a good strategy. But what if <coughs> it is difficult to observe and <coughs> that it's not easy to see if you played aggressive or not. If it's not that easy to observe in the marketplace. But there is a second, and uh, the, the third dimension, nature is playing. There is another player, nature. And nature introduce uncertainty and imperfect information. You don't really know the outcome because nature is playing. <coughs> For instance, in <coughs> the electricity market, you will definitely see in Norway that it's not easy to know how the different players will play in the marketplace just by observing because in that market nature plays with rain and nature plays with temperature. If it's very rainy it will give high capacity. If it's very cold the capacity is needed. So nature is in many markets playing and if you introduce nature <coughs> it's not that easy always <coughs> to conclude that tit for tat is a good strategy. But from the textbook, next one.
there is a strategy that they call tit for two that instead of responding in the first round you are more patient and you wait and you finally respond in the end next one this is the way it works if you play tit for two tat so tit for tat is a good strategy but if there are uncertainties and nature selects by random rain or cold weather and if you're just patient and just don't respond immediately I trust my rival this happens just once and I wait one round more then tit for tat is even tit for two tat is even a better strategy than tit for tat so <coughs> Now we have learned one more dimension, time matters, the ability to, to observe cheating and the possibilities to punish is important and when you play, you play always trying to change the rules of the game strategically so that you achieve the collusion solution okay. next one <coughs> then <coughs> there is a new simple model that is much much more aggressive. We go to the same model that we are used to with that Boeing Airbus model 100 minus Q the model cost is 10 the monopolistic solution is 45 you remember that? And the Kono solution, when they play over quantity, was 30, 30, 60. And the maximum profit as a player under Monopoly is totally for two players, 20, 25. And for one, 10, 12.5, their share and the price level when they achieve collusion is 55 <coughs> now there is a model with a time dimension they play forever and they start playing and ask can we keep on colluding? And one of the players say, I am so aggressive that if you start cheating, I will punish you forever and play modern cost pricing forever. We will earn nothing as long as we exist. So don't cheat. Don't cheat. Is this a good strategy? 
Let's see. Let's see what happens if one of the players is tempted to cheat. What will he or she achieve? In the first round, <coughs> that is modulary to individual rival, and you captured 10, 12.5, and a little bit less since you have to underbid modulary, but close to 10, 12.5, that is the incentive to cheat. But then you know, if you are so short-sighted, you will have that in round one, and you will have no profit for the rest of your life. And that means that, can you go to the next picture? For this to be profitable for one player, <coughs> and then you need to have that. I mean, you capture the whole, the whole mon monopoly profit. Twenty twenty-five is what you capture if you are not. Everything. So here is the alternative. If you detect, you earn twenty point twenty five. But if you go on colluding, you earn 10, 12.5 forever. And you can see from that formula that 10, 0, 12 dollar multiplied with 1 plus the, the discount rate divided on the discount rate, that's just the formula in net present value that will give you what you will earn when you play in infinity and you earn 10, 12 each year with discount rate E forever. And if that profit is higher than 2025, You keep on colluding. And you can easily see from this formula <coughs> that if the discount rate is what we normally put the discount rate to be, around zero, s zero 0 0.05, around 5%, maybe even less, or five percent, then it's always most profitable to collude. So the only reason to cheat is that you have a hit and run player that is an in serious, unserious company that for some reason just come up and try to capture a high profit immediately and do not at all look at future profit. You must be so short-sighted that you don't bother about future profit. So again, in real life, because the discount rate is round four five. If it's easy to observe that you cheat, if you're going to play for a long while, 
just without contracting, just by signaling to each other, the two players can easily, by being very aggressive, manage to drive the game into the monopolistic solution just by being very aggressive. If you don't play according to being a monopolist, I will punish you forever. And it works. Of course it works. <coughs> and in, in the textbook, there is some, some uh, inflections added to this. If you have um, uncertainties, and if you have probabilities for playing the next round, you change the conclu you change the conclusion a little bit. So the more uncertainty, the higher the discount rate must be, and the lower probability for playing next year, the higher the discount rate must be. But in real life, if you play many times, and if uncertainties is not too high, then you can conclude from this that the kind of tit for tat, tit for two tat, or trigger strategy, that was the most aggressive one, will lead to an incentive system for both players to play with no contract in accordance with the high price solution. Can you see that? That is the first part of Christus Delamayen, where the time dimension matters, tit for tat, tit for two tat, or the very aggressive grim strategy is enough to change the rules of the game into collusion. With no contract. And that is not an eagle. That is allowed. And it is what we call a signal game. Next one. Ah! Finally, the oil market, the cartel, OPEC is playing. Now, it is the first cartel model, OPEC. The oil prices now is in between 86 and 87, and still the Norwegian krona is very weak, and therefore I'm very happy. The oil process is high enough. The Norwegian krona is quite weak, but the oil companies in the short run, they have problems. But that is because they have themselves driven their own costs very, very high too fast. So they just had to do this correction. And it will take some years. And it will be tough to some people, not very tough. I just heard 
that they outsourced the the uh, one of the the uh, the uh, divisions in Stavanger to India and the labor force were given full pension and the pension within the oil sector that's they are very very good so they will have a full pension from Statoil and if they will find a new job they still have the pension <laughs> So this is the OPEC. You have a demand curve that is called demand fellowship, which means that the cartel members follow the rules decided by the leader of the cartel. They try to maximize profit for the cartel as a whole. So they are playing as a cartel. And this model starts with P0. This is one company that is a player. <coughs> and to begin with, this player follow the demand curve, D follows it. The price level is P0, <coughs> and this country will sell Q0 oil, and everything is peaceful, and they live luckily together. But all of a sudden, this country definitely have a king that wants to build a new castle. And to build a new castle to his wife, he needs more money. Then he looks at the D not fellowship curve. And he go to his his uh, economists and ask what happens if I cheat? <coughs> if I move along the D not fellowship dimension starts at P0 and if I cheat marginally I just marginally underbid all the other countries down to P cheat can you tell me what are the elasticity of demand? How steep is the curve? And he will come back and tell you. Hmm? If you just under with the marginally down to P cheat, you will sell instead of Q0, you sell Q cheat. And then he goes back to his wife and say and ask her, do you need two cousins? And she say yes. Okay. Then we cheat. And it's very easy to cheat here. Because you cannot easily observe how you export all your oil. It's dark during the night. And you can just deliver when it's dark to a country that never signed a contract. You just move a big tanker to a non-existing country and then the cartel has not seen you. And you deliver and you're able to sell Q cheat, you sell that to P cheat. And the rest of the cartel, 
What about them? They don't worry at the beginning because they just see that the prices fall modernly. But it was a very small decrease, so it doesn't matter. So they will say, I can live with that. And then they take a break. Time for a break. Well, the story was so interesting. <laughs> I could see that. You saw that castle? Turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs>